Dans quoi le Canada investit aujourd'hui? Nous résumer l'annonce. It's very important that Canada today, I have to respond in English, I'm sorry. It's very important that we make this investment today because in fact Canada has a wide body of fantastic researchers who actually have expertise in the area of virology, in the area of vaccine development, in the area of uh, treatment of, of, of viruses and also all of the social issues that go along with, uh, with an outbreak like this. And so uh, today we're making an investment of $27 million dollars to stimulate that research and support it. Uh, I want to thank obviously the researchers who applied but also the CIHR who coordinated uh, a very very fast process to get this money out the door. Qui fait ses démarches un petit peu dans, dans son coin, chacun de son côté, ou c'est dans une, dans une volonté de collaboration et de concertation mondiale? On a effectivement la démonstration ce matin d'une démonstration, d'une concertation à l'échelle nationale et internationale. Internationale parce que les experts qui vont euh, produire les travaux de recherche tellement importants sont déjà en contact avec leurs collègues à l'international. Nationale aussi parce que, comme vous le savez, il y a à peine deux jours, on a mis en place à, à Ottawa un, cabinet, un comité du cabinet spécial pour lutter contre le coronavirus. Donc, tout ça fait en sorte que les gens travaillent ensemble. La collaboration avec les provinces est essentielle, évidemment, dans ce contexte. Les agences de santé publique à travers le pays travaillent étroitement ensemble. Donc, les deux mots-clés, c'est assurance, mais aussi prudence. Rassurer les Canadiens que tout le monde fait partie de la solution, mais aussi se préparer, si jamais il y a besoin, d'avoir des actions rapides et efficaces de la part des acteurs concernés. Euh, si je peux rajouter ça. Ce que les chercheurs nous ont dit ce matin, alors qu'on a eu des bonnes conversations avec eux, c'est qu'ils euh, sont déjà en contact, not notamment avec plusieurs chercheurs à travers le monde. Donc, il y a plusieurs exemples de projets qui sont financés par nos euh, instituts de recherche via le gouvernement du Canada. Mais en même temps, il y a des collaborations avec des chercheurs euh, en Italie, euh, euh, en France, euh, aux États-Unis. Donc, on, on voit présentement qu'on est vraiment dans un, un travail de concertation mondiale. Et c'est la façon euh, de travailler présentement parce qu'on le sait que le virus affecte plus de 90 pays. Euh, L'argent annoncé aujourd'hui par le fédéral euh, ne concerne pas seulement des études scientifiques, mais aussi euh, d'autres mesures. Est-ce que vous pourriez être plus spécifique là-dessus? En fait, euh, ce que mes collègues ont euh, annoncé, c'est non seulement 27 millions pour euh, soutenir la recherche fondamentale au niveau scientifique, mais aussi comprendre un peu plus les impacts sociaux. Euh, de, de l'évolution du virus. Donc, comment, euh, lorsque, par exemple, on met une personne en quarantaine, comment, comment elle réagit, quels sont les impacts aussi euh, au niveau de sa propre santé financière, euh, comment on peut aussi euh, travailler avec les institutions municipales, euh, publiques, pour savoir euh, quels sont les, les, les impacts psychologiques des, des gens qui sont, qui sont impactés. Est-ce que quelqu'un peut nous donner une idée de ce que ça représente, 27 millions, par rapport à ce qu'on a déjà, par exemple, investi dans une pour une autre menace de santé ou mmh. par rapport au budget global de la recherche, vous donnez une idée de la, de la grandeur. S'il vous plaît, je parle en anglais, s'il vous plaît. Donc, la breadth de la recherche qui est being covered, c'est ce que vous demandez. C'est une très very broad range, mais elle aligne très bien avec ce qui se passe internationalement, comme nos collègues à la table ont dit. Une très bonne intégration. Donc, pensez-le en deux buckets principaux buckets les social implications de l'infection et and, and we could drill down on that if you would like to and then on the clinical research side to everything from developing a vaccine to direct treatment therapies to trying to modify how the, the virus might actually work um, and then looking at ways of better detection more rapidly point of care detection so being able to be on top of it right away trying to do as much as we can to treat it right away and then developing things that will take a little longer to bring to the table and, of your normal budget? Yeah, so, 1%, uh, 0.5 or? Yeah, so if I may, just to highlight what uh, was said by Michael, the announcement today is for $27 million. That's specifically targeted towards the mitigating measures, the diagnostics, uh, combating um, misinformation, looking at vaccines and, and the prospects of developing that in a more quickly, in a, a timely manner. But that's just the initial investment. We will continue to make additional investments on a need basis. Uh, as you know, our government in 2018 invested $4 billion 
in fundamental research and $10 billion over the last four years. So we have significant resources, federal labs, uh, federal researchers at our disposal. We have got world-class researchers behind us who are working around the clock, and we made it very clear that we're willing to deploy the resources required. And of course, this is in conjunction with collaboration with our international partners as well through the World Health Organization. Um, and in particular, the Chief Science Advisor, Mona Neymar, is working with nine other jurisdictions to look at how we can continue to collaborate together to avoid duplication, to share best practices, uh, and to uh, work on joint efforts together as well on a going forward basis. So today is a significant investment, uh, but, but it's important to note that if additional resources are required, we are willing to step up and provide those additional resources. Je pense aussi que ce qui a été dit par mes collègues, c'est que, euh, dans le fond, ce qui est important de, de se rappeler, c'est qu'on a été capable de faire ça en six semaines. Donc, la rapidité du processus, mm -hmm. le fait que la ministre Aïdou, le ministre Baines étaient vraiment là pour réagir rapidement, alors qu'on sait qu'on doit rapidement euh, être en mesure de trouver une solution à, à ce virus. I have a question about if you think you have the coronavirus or if there are fears as it, you know, becomes more predominant. One aspect question, it would be if somebody has just returned, say a father just came back from Iran, he's got his family here, uh, decides to self-isolate or, or, or um, quarantine himself. What measures should be taken then for the family members? We had a student at McGill University that wanted to get out of his exams because this exact same thing mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. What do you tell families of, of people who are self-quarantining mm -hmm. themselves? Well, first of all, it's really important. Uh, it's really important, first of all, to define the difference between isolating and, and, and quarantining. Quarantining is you know, controlling a large number of people or a small number of people who may not even have the virus. So putting a place under quarantine. We saw that, for example, with the ship off the shores of uh, Japan, that would be considered a quarantine. Self-isolation is what people recommend when they are concerned, public health would recommend when they are concerned that persons have come into contact or are ill. Um, so the person who returned from Iran should be working with their public health authority and with their medical professionals so that they can understand, first of all, that if they are, uh, if they do have the virus, and they would be a good candidate if they've just recently returned from Iran to receive a test from public health. In fact, I would suspect that that would be exactly what would happen. I met with Minister McCann yesterday. Uh, the pr Quebec is all over this. They are um, completely ramped up and able to test people that meet uh, criteria, especially with international travel. In terms of if he is uh, found to have the virus, to be positive for the virus, then yes, his family members who were close contacts of him, if they're living with him, for example, if he's had recent contact with them, would also be asked to isolate, which is why this creates disruption in communities. So the request of the student to be excused from his exams, if in fact he's been advised by public health to self-isolate, would be a very logical request. And in fact, universities, colleges, workplaces should be looking for ways that they can support these kinds of increasing requests. That's part of the work that we've been doing at the special committee is to look how we support employers, but also people who will lose uh, pay, who students who will obviously be disrupted from studies. And it's going to take all of us as organizations to work together to make sure that we're supporting people like the young man you mentioned. But how do you protect the children from the potential uh, threat from a parent coming back from a trip? Well, listen, I think that's the nature of viruses, is they spread amongst populations, and obviously we're working very hard as communities to make sure that everybody's protected. But I will remind Canadians that those are who are at most risk of having a very severe expression of the illness are those that are actually older. Um, in fact, people that have immune, uh, compromised immune systems, people who have underlying health conditions, older people, oftentimes in more frail conditions, are the ones that are experiencing a more severe expression of the illness. So uh, in that regard, it's very important that we're thinking about the vulnerable people in our lives, our elders, our seniors, people who are ill, and taking precautions to protect them. One of the ways that you can do that is not visiting them if you're sick uh, or arranging to help them get their needs met in the community so they can avoid large crowds like the grocery store. And it's never too start early to start thinking about that because this is a rapidly changing situation. We can see that, in fact, uh, not the cases are rising in Canada, and we want communities to be prepared prepared to take care of one another. On the topic of big groups, we saw the San Jose Sharks. It was recommended by the California government that they not host, hold the game in front of 
spectators like we saw in Europe with soccer games. What is your advice to organizations that want to hold big events as we look ahead as if the virus does get worse? Mm -hmm. What do you tell these organizations? What would you recommend in a case like that? So again, each case is specific um, and those decisions are made either at the provincial level, depending on the size of the event, or at the local level if it's a locally hosted event. And they're made with guidance from Health Canada, but they're also made depending on the nature of the virus in that community. If there is no cases of the virus, if the virus is not circulating in the community, the jurisdiction may decide to go ahead and hold the event. But that also might depend on the number of international travelers that they expect as well, or travelers in this case. Um, maybe from the United States. I mean, let's not forget we share a border with the United States, 127 land borders. So these are the kinds of considerations that public health agencies at the provincial and the local level are making. Make no mistake, they are thinking about those things. We are thinking about those things through the lens of the federal events that we'll be hosting, as well as things like our tourism season that is coming up and how we protect communities from an influx of visitors that may uh, create additional health stresses for communities that are, are struggling with health services. Shut down these events? No, that is not uh, how our jurisdictional uh, reality works. Um, I, I have every confidence in my provincial counterparts. The health ministers here in Quebec, for example, Minister McCann has a pandemic plan for Ke Quebec. We'll be working with uh, all of the municipalities and the regional health authorities to make sure that they make those decisions promptly and wisely. F the federal government actually provides technical advice and support to provinces to make those decisions, but it is uh, the decision of the jurisdiction. And on the tourism side, we know that many organizations are following basically the uh, directives from uh, from from health officials. Uh, meanwhile, we're, uh, we've been having a good meetings, monitoring the situation, as of course the tourism industry is is deeply affected by this. Yeah, how, so, how, how would you say uh, in Canada and in Quebec, have you noticed a change? Well, we already know that, for example, Chinese uh, tourists uh, have uh, have gone down, and uh, we're only at 40% of our land capacity with China right now. When you compare to December, uh, the tourism sector for just Chinese tourists have a, a two billion dollar uh, worth of uh, of impact in Canada, and we expect that to go down by 550 million dollars by June. That's an example. Uh, to give you another example, uh, the uh, duty-free boutique at the Vancouver Airport is down 50% of its revenues. Uh, so that's why the Minister of Finance and I have been in contact and I've been having uh, close, good conversations with my ministerial counterparts across the country. And if I could just add to that, that is the purpose of the special committee that the Prime Minister announced this week, and that is uh, being co-chaired uh, with, uh, I think, Minister Duclos is the vice chair of that committee, I believe. Uh, <laughs> good, I got that right. He looked at me strangely, so I, wanted, I thought I might have made a mistake. But, <laughs> um, but that committee is exactly, uh, that's the purpose of the committee, is to look at the financial impacts, the social impacts, the logistics of running a government while we have a virus in, in our country, to anticipate the needs of provinces and territories so we can be there from a financial perspective, from an equipment perspective. And I'm very grateful that the Prime Minister has, has uh, struck this committee because, of course, as a Minister of Health, my focus is very, uh, very firmly on the health of Canadians, but there are obviously social impacts that need to be addressed. Permettez-moi de, de résumer ce qu'on entend un peu ce matin. Le, on est en train de parler d'information, non seulement pour fournir plus d'informations avec le travail des chercheurs qui sont derrière nous, mais aussi pour lutter contre la désinformation. Il y a beaucoup de désinformation au Canada et on a des chercheurs et un milieu scientifique solide à l'échelle canadienne qui vont nous aider au cours des prochaines semaines à bien informer les Canadiens. Et en termes d'information, il faut aussi, évidemment, prendre note du fait que le Canada est différent des autres pays. Nous avons au Canada un régime de santé publique universel, solide, un, un régime collaboratif entre le gouvernement fédéral et les provinces. Nous ne sommes pas comme dans d'autres pays qui ont plus de difficultés non seulement à faire circuler l'information correctement, mais à s'assurer que les gens reçoivent les traitements dont ils ont besoin. Évidemment, ça nous oblige quand même à suivre avec attention ce qui se passe au Canada, mais avec ce que vous voyez derrière nous, avec ce que vous avez entendu au cours des derniers jours, on va être prêt au Canada à réagir correctement en temps opportun à ce qui va se produire. Mais justement, en parlant des frontières, le syndicat des droits de l'immigration va savoir plus 
d'aide et d'appui parce qu'il y a passé de l'argent dans les aéroports. Est-ce que ça, vous avez pensé à ça? Il y a quelque chose qui s'en vient pour vous? Et la réponse est oui. Évidemment, nous sommes un pays très ouvert sur le monde. Nous avons une frontière avec 127 euh, postes de douane avec les États-Unis. Donc, il faut être très conscient que la santé et la sécurité des Canadiens dépend beaucoup de notre capacité de suivre les déplacements à travers les frontières. Euh, les, les, les postes de douane, les aéroports et les ports sont présentement équipés comme il le faut. Mais si on s'aperçoit que d'autres investissements doivent être faits, ça va certainement être fait aussi. Alors, tout ça est étroitement surveillé. Euh, les agents font leur travail. On a confiance dans leur travail. Évidemment, ils ont un travail plus, euh, plus, plus, plus lourd à faire qu'auparavant. Entre autres, ils doivent s'assurer que le flux de, de voyageurs entrant au Canada est correctement informé euh, des risques qu'il y a à entrer au Canada euh, sans savoir, sans connaître les procédures élémentaires de santé publique, donc de se protéger soi-même, mais aussi de protéger les gens, les proches et la famille. Et on aura de bonnes conversations avec le syndicat. Je comprends que M. Fortin est arrivé avec certaines préoccupations ce matin. C'était de la nouvelle information. On a eu une conversation en tant que comité ce matin. Ça a été soulevé. Alors, on fera le suivi. Dernière question. Si ça prend un an, un an, un an et demi à, à faire un vaccin, euh, avec cette concertation, alors cet argent neuf, euh, cet échange avec les, 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 les corps de scientifiques de partout dans le monde, est-ce que vous croyez qu'on peut raccourcir cette période-là pour en arriver à un vaccin? Mais ce qu'on a entendu ce matin de la part des chercheurs, c'est trois choses. Un, c'est qu'effectivement, pour développer un vaccin, le, le tester, ça prend un certain temps. Mais deux, c'est que les investissements substantiels qui ont été annoncés ce matin permettent de mieux diagnostiquer plus rapidement les, les infections qui peuvent exister au Canada et aussi de mieux les traiter avec les, parfois des, des molécules et des, des anticorps qui existent déjà, mais qui peuvent être légèrement modifiés et davantage partagés pour protéger la santé des Canadiens qui pourraient être infectés. Et trois, ben c'est qu'en travaillant avec les, les autres chercheurs dans le monde auxquels la communauté est, est, est bien connectée, ben on va euh, probablement ra raccourcir le temps de production de ces vaccins et le temps de ces anticorps, de production de ces anticorps. And, and what aspects? We talked about it briefly. What really are we going to study with this $27 million, and are we hoping to be the first to make the vaccine? Mm -hmm. It's less of a competition, I would say, and more of a collaboration with the world. I mean, listen, this is about making sure that Canada is able to participate in this research that's happening globally, that we have Canadian solutions that are being developed, that we could uh, amplify the work that's happening in all of the countries that are racing to try and find a cure. This is really a time for the world to pull together and it also allows Canada to be at the ground level of this research so that when a vaccine is developed we are partners with other countries that we can access that vaccine or that treatment uh, quickly and uh, the third aspect of the research obviously to understand the impact of the things that you were asking about earlier the things about social isolation how that affects our communities uh, the changes in behavior that is happening already and how we actually govern ourselves as a country as communities how do we make those decisions around um, cancelling events and closing down institutions, uh, those are all very important decisions as a government and uh, that, that we have to make live time, but certainly uh, learning from these experiences will add to our evidence that we've developed uh, through experiences like SARS. Thank you very much. Merci tout le monde. Merci. 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 Merci beaucoup.